We all want to understand why people are driven to kill so we can prevent these awful tragedies. But how do we get ahead of crazy if we don't know how crazy thinks? The riveting new Netflix show Mindhunter depicts the sinister investigative odyssey of two FBI agents probing the depths of killers' minds to discover the brutal answers and comprehend the motivations of killing. Mindhunter, October 13th, only on Netflix. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the establishment of a lesser-known cult, the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, Based out of Uganda, much of the history of this doomsday cult is shrouded in mystery, except for its bloody and disastrous ending. In part one of our two-part series, we'll focus on the three primary leaders of the movement, their lives before the formation of the movement, and how they came together to form one of the deadliest cults in world history. In part two, we will shift our focus from the leaders to the cult they established, the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, otherwise known as the Movement. We will see how the leaders sucked more followers into their psychotic orbit, how they established full control of their lives, and how they were able to successfully function in the countryside of southwestern Uganda for over a decade, until doomsday really did arrive for the movement itself. First, a reading from the opening chapter of the movement's main ideological text, a timely message from heaven, the end of present times. The Virgin and her Holy Child wish for all the people to restore the Ten Commandments of the Lord and to repent and to inform you of the worldwide mission for which Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary have come on earth. These words, credited to the spirit of the Virgin Mary herself, were translated from the heavenly source by a woman soon to be ominously known as the Programmer. And with these words, Credonia Merinde, a bartender with a humble background, created a text that would lead over a thousand people into a death cult. Called the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, the cult officially operated between the years of 1989 and 2000, both its beginning and ending was shrouded in many shades of mystery. Some believe a few of the leaders even survived the cult's final judgment day. As for its inception, like many cult histories, there is a conscious effort during their construction to obfuscate the creation story. The true-to-life story of banal networking and plotting is far less compelling than the divine origin tales the cult highlights for the public and its followers. However, the story of the movement is clouded by more than the efforts of the cult's leaders. It's also hidden by the dense and unrecorded historical aspects of its country of origin. Uganda, freed from British colonial rule in 1962, never found steady ground in the following decades. By the 1980s, dictator Idi Amin Dada led a brutal regime over the country. This was the societal climate that eventually helped spawn the movement. Not helping research matters, police records from the time are scattered. And as we will come to learn, the movement itself involved some high up individuals in Ugandan government bureaucracy. Record keeping was forbidden by those who were not leaders in the cult. Most information on Credonia, her fellow leaders, and the movement itself arrive as hearsay from family members, neighbors, and defectors alike. The clearest portrait of the movement's legacy doesn't come into focus until its bloody end on March 17, 2000, in a brutal cleansing of the entire cult that left many wondering if it was a mass suicide or a mass murder. Most Western news sources presented conflicting accounts, and no one seemed to care enough to sort any of it out. Until the publishing of The Ugandan Cult Tragedy, A Private Investigation, written by historian and professor Bernard Atuher. A Ugandan, Atuher was raised and schooled near the epicenter of the movement's activities, and the clearest timeline of the cult and those who cultivated it comes from his persistent and in-depth research. But before we get into the tragedy of March 17th itself, a lot needs to be said about Uganda. 
Vanessa is going to cover on the psychology here and throughout the episode. So please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she's done a lot of research for the show. Thanks, Greg. More specifically, the context we need to cover first is the religious history of Uganda itself, a foreign and unknown place to most Westerners. While the movement sprang from Roman Catholicism, its followers were forged in the history of Uganda and its own spiritual beliefs and tendencies. Before explorers and missionaries began to arrive in mass in the 19th century, the various kingdoms that would one day be colonized within the borders of future Uganda had solidified political institutions all their own. Interestingly enough, the widest spread religious movement was monotheistic, based around the creator God, known by various names including Katonda, Kazuba, and Ruhanga. Yet there was also a cultic element to this religious history, in the loosest sense. Various clans within the kingdoms worship their own lesser gods and spirits. Called the Imandwa, clan leaders formed local cults around various names in this vast mythology. These clans and their cultures found themselves challenged by the missionaries of Europe and the Middle East. Islam arrived first, in the mid-19th century. By 1877, Anglican missionaries found their way to the area. Finally, in 1879, the Roman Catholics arrived. Although the system of Ruhanga and the Imandwa was not so different than the god of Catholicism and the large swath of saints and angels, the missionaries spat upon the local tradition as pantheistic heresy. As colonialism gained a firm grip across Africa, the religious missions became the center points of cultural power. As Atu Hare writes in his history, everything African was suppressed, and a foreign body was inserted into a different context. Everything African was considered inferior to anything imported. While the religious substructures were not so different, the Catholics made sure the native inhabitants learn who was in charge now through their insistence of religious superiority. This was just one of the many facets of African cultural devaluation, and just one of the many long-lasting scars of immoral colonialism. But it's the most important place to begin when telling the story of the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments. There's one clear sign of Catholicism's hold on the citizens of 20th century Uganda. The Virgin Mary had apparently decided it was a worthwhile place to visit. Within the Catholic religion, there is a phenomenon known as the Marian apparition. Such rare moments are when the Blessed Virgin Mother's spirit appears on our earthly plane, usually to only one or two seers. The first official apparition arrived in 40 AD when St. James the Apostle spotted Mary in Saragossa, Spain. This is one of many such sightings canonized by the Pope in Rome and given an official designation, Our Lady of the Pillar. Throughout history, there have been 15 sightings canonized by the Vatican, from Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1531 to Our Lady of Fatima in 1917. These sightings were able to help the Catholic mission achieve global reach. Areas ranging from Mexico to France were made to feel blessed by these confirmed sightings. When awarded with the Pope's recognition, locals' faith and devotion to Roman Catholicism grew. To gain such an official validation was difficult to achieve, but if modern times have taught us anything, sometimes the validation doesn't matter much at all. As the 20th century dragged onward, more and more such sightings cropped up around the globe. The following Philippine sighting was never recognized by the church. A huge crowd turned out in a northern Philippine town Saturday to see an apparition of the Virgin Mary. They were drawn to the town of Agoo by reports that a 12-year-old boy had been seeing the Virgin every first Saturday in the month since 1989. There was one shot down from urban New Jersey. The Catholic Church is not supporting claims that the so-called Marlboro Apparition, a four-member commission appointed by the Trenton Diocese, says there is no evidence the Virgin Mary appears to Joseph Janiskevich of Marlboro, Monmouth County. The commission found that they were uh, somewhat harsh in their tone and uh, calling for priests to reflect. Diocesan spokesman Joe Donadu says the commission, appointed by Bishop John Reese, found those who attended sighting sessions were inspired, but there was no miracle. Joe Cutter, Trenton, New Jersey. But others, like the sighting of Fatima in Portugal, are still revered by the Vatican as holy pilgrimage points to this day. Here is current Pope Francis reading a prayer in front of a large crowd in St. Peter's Square before a journey to Fatima. Mi pellegrino a Fatima, 
per affidare alla Madonna le sorti temporali ed eterne dell'umanità. Newly colonized areas wanted to get in on the game. Perhaps the church would recognize their sightings and they would join the historic ranks. There was not much to lose and a lot to gain. The believers of Uganda were no different. Often, even if the sightings went unverified by the church at large, the supposed seer would gain a certain notoriety or local fame. If they weren't going to be made into official saints, at least they could become local celebrities. For capable manipulators, this reputation could lead to influence. And for one woman, from humble beginnings, it would lead to becoming the leader of an infamous and widespread cult. Her name was Credonia Mirinde, born in 1952 in the titular city of the Kanangu district. Credonia's parents were Paul and Farazia Kashaku. While there is very little recorded about her early life, probably due to Credonia's own influence and myth-making, it's safe to assume the family was somewhat engaged in the large Catholic community in the district. What is known is that Credonia was never well-behaved. She did not fit into the mold of a pious Catholic girl. She was quick to anger, and as she aged, known to be promiscuous. This is an unusual behavior for a young person within a religious community. Rebellion is the natural response to such a controlled upbringing. They grow up in a cloistered setting, with parents and religious teachers guiding their thoughts. But once a child is old enough to explore without their parents' guidance, there's a good chance they will learn that there are many other ways to live a life. The more Credonia strayed, the more her parents urged her back into the church. Religion, as the missionaries promised, had arrived in Uganda to save their souls. It was the answer. If religion did not prove a young person with the proper answers, they might be written off as a lost cause. Credonia was well on her way to being labeled as such. In her early 20s, Credonia hit her first stumbling block when she fell in love with a local health officer. A man who could offer her a future free from the overbearing control of religion. But the official jilted her, or at least from Credonia's perspective, she was rejected. In response, Credonia did not turn to prayer. No, instead she broke into the man's house and set his belongings on fire. Credonia was shipped off to a mental ward, but they were unable to accurately diagnose her in any meaningful way. After some months passed, they labeled Credonia as mentally disturbed and sent her packing. Such a response probably didn't help Credonia establish a direction in life. Mm -mm. It's no wonder Credonia never again turned to psychology for help in sorting out her inner demons. It seemed to be a sham in her eyes. Mm -hmm. From the evidence of her early life, what do you think was really going on in her head, Vanessa? Again, it's very important to reiterate that there is next to no evidence of Credonia's life before she founded the movement. We have to carefully draw very thin and tenuous lines between the recorded actions we do know. Having said that, it's clear that mentally disturbed is far from useful. While the term borderline personality disorder is still vague and even questioned by many modern psychologists as anything more than an umbrella term for more difficult to diagnose disorders, the general profile seems to fit Credonia. What aspects of the diagnosis fit with Credonia's personality? A borderline personality is characterized by very unstable emotions. That, in turn, leads to impulsive or dangerous behavior patterns. There can be intense periods of anger that spiral into anxiety or depression. This begins a caustic cycle, with behavior and emotion feeding off of each other. Credonia's behavior also exhibits signs of sociopathy. Her actions speak to a self-centered focus, one prone to making dramatic and violent decisions. Many sociopaths exhibit narcissism, meaning they crave attention and put their own well-being over anyone else in their lives. If slighted, sociopaths may take it as an earth-shattering event and respond in kind. Whatever the case might have been, it's also a tragic one, in a sense. There was no way Credonia could have ever been properly diagnosed at the time, likely not even in a place like the United States. After being shuttled through a failed attempt at a pure Catholic upbringing and a failed trip to the mental hospital, many around Credonia looked down on her. So you think she began seeking meaning elsewhere? Well, no, I don't think she even knew there was anywhere else to turn. Instead, I think Credonia decided to create her own meaning and to take control of her own fate using the skills she knew she had in spades. A natural charisma and the ability to tempt others to join her on darker or riskier pursuits. It would certainly explain the next big move in her life. As I mentioned earlier, in the 1980s, Uganda had fallen under the control of the brutal dictator Idi Amin Dada. 
Over the course of the next decade, the economy and infrastructure of the nation would enter a tailspin. Credonia needed safe harbor, and she found a temporary refuge by marrying Eric Mazima, another Kanangu local. She convinced him to evict his second wife from her home and invest the money in her, all so she could open a bar in Kanungu that she would run. Interestingly enough, one fact that pops up in multiple accounts of Credonia's early life is her skill as a brewer of banana beer. If only she stuck to such innocent money-making schemes. Instead, her violent streak continued to grow. An unverifiable story can be found in the account of one family friend who wrote a letter to someone else in Credonia's family. Sometime during the 1980s, this family friend believed that Credonia committed her first murder. The details are few, but frightening in their specificity. One night, Credonia lured a weary traveler who stopped into her bar upstairs. In the morning, the regular crew stopped by for an early morning drink of Credonia's famed banana beer and found her scrubbing what seemed to be blood from the concrete floor. Credonia appeared unfazed by their presence and asked what the drunkards of the early hours might like from her menu. This is another clear sign pointing to a sociopathic streak within Credonia, if not a full-fledged psychopathy. Credonia would be caught in risky situations like this, and her response would be a smile or a joke. It's almost playful, a defense mechanism against feeling like a broken, useless object in God's kingdom. Well, maybe that's why she decided to use that charm to infiltrate God's kingdom. While this date comes from Credonia's later writings and should be taken with a huge grain of salt, she supposedly encountered her first Marian apparition in March of 1981. Credonia said the virgin spirit told her to repent for her sins and return to the flock she had abandoned. Whether or not Credonia believed the sighting actually occurred, it was during the next decade as Idi Amin's unstable dictatorship fell to pieces and the country slid into civil war that she decided she was worthy of sainthood. Mm. Perhaps it was the chaos that gave her hope. In the mess, she could claw her way to legitimacy and major influence. She rewrote her narrative during the 1980s. Credonia began playing up her promiscuous image, starting a rumor that she was a prostitute as well as a bartender. While it's possible the claim is based on some truth, her husband Mazima refuted it. It didn't matter. Mazima wasn't her husband for long. After all, if Credonia was to be a modern-day Mary Magdalene, she needed to appear as deeply engaged in sin as possible, because her redemption was on the horizon. This was Credonia's craftiest move yet, and a sign of her master narrative building still to come during her reign over the movement. In 1989, Credonia's bar went broke, just as both Idi Amin's regime and her marriage fell apart. But Credonia already had a new plan. June 14, 1989 marked the occasion of Credonia's second Marian apparition. It was during this vision in a cave outside of Kanungu that Mary delivered unto Credonia the words that would become the opening salvo of the movement's text, a timely message from heaven. The mission was made clear to her. The time was coming for the sinners of humanity to repent, and they needed a leader to show them the way. Next, the Blessed Mother tasked Credonia with seeking out a partner in this endeavor. His name was Joseph Kibwetere. This is such a fascinating story. I love finding the unusual, unknown stories hidden in history. In fact, I host a whole other podcast about this called Historical Figures that I'm going to take a quick minute to discuss. Every week on Historical Figures, my co-host Carter and I dig up what you don't know about the icons you do know. And it's such a fun show. It's also produced by Parcast, so you can count on an entertainment, information, and top quality production value. Right. Some of Parcast's most loyal fans may recall me doing a history show. That's because Historical Figures is a reboot of the podcast Remarkable Lives, Tragic Deaths, which was named one of Apple Podcast's best debuts of 2016. Not too shabby. On Historical Figures, Carter and I cover their major accomplishments and significance, but we also show you the real humanity behind mythologized figures. Every Wednesday, we spotlight the real personalities behind a big name, sharing entertaining anecdotes and little-known facts. So, where can I listen? 
Well, Historical Figures officially launches on October 11th, but we're offering a sneak peek for loyal ParCast listeners. You can find our first episode on Albert Einstein on Historical Figures feed right now on your favorite podcast directory. Just search Historical Figures in your podcast directory. Check it out. Joseph Kibwetere was born into the Catholic religion somewhere in Western Uganda in the year 1932. Wealthy by Ugandan standards, in possession of a lot of land, Joseph's family was pious in the strictest sense. This gave them an automatic leg up in the community, as religious leaders gave them preferential treatment. This, in turn, reinforced their religiosity and devotion to the institution of the church. It's no surprise that Joseph Kibwetere saw himself as a born leader, destined for greatness. Above the poorer class from the start, he envisioned a grand future, leading them into the truth and prosperity the church assured people like him. Not much more is known about his formative years. History picks up with Kibwetere again in 1960, when he married a woman named Teresa. With a respectable and devoted wife by his side, Kibwetere decided it was now time to chart his path to the top he worked as an assistant supervisor to his area's Catholic school system. Even in the beginning of his career, he was obsessed with the prestige of administration. As the stature grew, so did his inheritance. His family acquired large swaths of land. This was the perfect image booster for him at the time and led to higher respect from those around him. Soon, he worked his way up to be the overseer for the district government's agricultural and construction projects. In Kibwetere's mind, he had paid his dues now, public service and religious service. The accolades were clear, and it was time to cash in. So Kibwetere threw his hat into the political ring in 1980 and lost the nomination flat out. Turns out all that he'd worked for just wasn't enough. Politics wasn't a science, it was a raffle, and he wasn't lucky enough this time. This seems like a big turning point, especially for Kibwetere's psychological outlook on the world. Mm -hmm. It must have been. Many who were born with a silver spoon in their mouth don't take kindly to rejection. It makes them both inwardly insecure and outwardly resentful. Kibwetere did in fact stage a hasty retreat, back to the land his family owned in Ruashamer. Now the lord of several large properties, hundreds of cattle, and a prosperous mill, he could cover up for his failure to enter a true position of government power. A frustrated politician never really changes, though. They just look for the next group of people they can lead. For the time, his family and employees did the trick. And I imagine that didn't last long. No, it did not. Much like Credonia, Kibwetere decided that if power wouldn't come to him one way, he would retreat to the original source of power in his life, religion. He funded the construction of a new Catholic school called Naya Kazinga Secondary. Built on his own land, it was something Kibwetere could completely own and totally control. Kibwetere taught at his own school, both headmaster and professor of religion. Like his own upbringing, the doctrine was strict. This would satisfy all the conditions for Kibwetere's drive in life. It wasn't a large-scale congregation, but it made him the most well-respected man in the community. It was also a direct line of access to young minds. No beating around the bush. Kibwetere lived to influence people, and there is no easier target than children. Orthodox religious schools offer a particular opportunity to teachers to not only teach, but truly mold. They can dig down into the most primal fears and hopes of these young people, appealing to them through stories of mythic redemption and dark sin. They can tell these young people that the world is a battle between good and evil, and if they want to be on the side of the good, they better figure out that they stand with the church. It's almost a self-reinforcing institution at this scale. The church gives Kibutari the influence and funds to build the school. In turn, his school supplies the church with new eager congregants who will eventually become either lifetime members and donors or even friars, nuns, and priests. While running this school, a greater change came over Kibutari's psychology. He became more of a proselytizer, he became more invested in the power of religion to control and influence. He was a man seeking power, and religion gave him that power. The strategy Credonia saw working in the religion she grew up around was exemplified in Kibwetere's life. Like most intelligent people with a desire for power, Kibwetere came to see myth-making as a key tool. The more respect he garnered, the more his image sparkled in the public eye, the greater his ego grew. Just as his school fed the church and the church fed the school, 
Kibuteri's certainty of purpose was continually reinforced by the feedback of his community. Essentially, he bought into his own hype, big time. But it's the specificity that truly brought Kibuteri and Credonia onto the same path. Empowered by religion, either in a euphoric illusion or calculated delusion, Kibuteri had a Marian sighting of his own on April 25th of 1984. Of course, he didn't have quite the same ambition as Credonia. She used her apparitions to gain local notoriety and eventually gain access to Kibuteri, a fellow fanatic. Kibuteri already had power and people already believed in him. Even during the movement, Kibuteri's visions were never given the detailed descriptions that characterize Credonia's visions. So what might have motivated the sighting? Well, one thing to read into this is that Kibuteri loved the idea of the Marian apparition. It seems like something out of Marketing 101. If one is to run a Catholic school, a blessing from the Virgin Mary is a strong stamp of approval. Kibuteri didn't need much proof to convince his locals of the Marian apparition's veracity. What he claimed was as good as gold in their eyes, and his own psychological need for belief had been imparted virally onto them. If the Virgin Mary blessed Kibuteri, she had vicariously blessed them all. It was just as Kibuteri had always claimed, they were a chosen people, just like any Israelite of the past. He appealed to their need for recognition within the greater structure of Roman Catholicism. While the Pope and his subordinates at the Vatican surely looked at the African colonies as little more than an expansion policy, those on the ground had successfully taken in the religion and its messages. Christianity had inhabited them, and now it would set them free. Kibuteri was moving up in life. Like Credonia in her bar, he was a master brewer in some ways. He had concocted a community that bubbled and swirled entirely around him. Yet in the end, he was still a big fish in a small backwater pond. It wasn't the prestigious life he had pictured for himself since childhood. While he received respect, there must have always been something nibbling at the back of his mind. What if he hadn't made himself good enough? What if he was settling? In 1989, like another vision from on high, an answer came to him in the form of Credonia Muerinde. She came with two women, cousins or sisters from her own family. They backed up Credonia's claim. The Virgin Mary had told them to seek out Kibwitere. This, in turn, inspired him, or at least gave a direct steroid injection to his ego. If Kibwitere hadn't quite believed himself before, all that changed now. There was no doubting the fact that the Blessed Mother had chosen him for a reason. Before him stood a woman claiming to need his help in a divine mission. Credonia held all the power in this situation. Kibuteri was a respected and wealthy community leader, and yet he was brought to his knees before a failed bartender and allegedly redeemed prostitute. This might seem strange at first thought, but it makes perfect sense. Kibuteri was intelligent, but he clearly didn't have the spark necessary to truly make himself known in the world. He was a staid bureaucrat without a real bureaucracy. Credonia was the embodiment of religious charisma. She had long departed from any doubts in herself, even those buried the deepest. And from that day forward, Kibuteri became her first true convert, outside her own family. 1989 was the year that the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God was truly born. She urged on Kibuteri's belief in his Marian apparition, and even gave him her own interpretation. The Virgin Mary had singled him out to be the leader of a new Catholic population in Uganda, a chosen population. She was molding his desires to fit her own needs. Kibuteri had become the student now. He was willing to submit behind the scenes if it meant fulfilling a greater destiny. It's obvious that women had far less influence in Ugandan society than men. Credonia's acquisition of Kibuteri's loyalty could be considered her first and most incredible miracle. She had made a man who believed himself a high authority to submit to her as a highest authority. But it was all for a purpose. Like the Blessed Mary supposedly told her, the movement would not come to be without Joseph Kibuteri. Credonia did not have the means nor the network to kickstart a following all her own. She needed a host body. Not only did she convince Kibuteri to put himself up on the altar as that host, but she made him believe it was his idea in the first place, his destiny finally coming true. An account from Kibuteri's son, Rugambwe, explains it as such. 
The next thing we knew, she was in our house, and they had decided to start their cult here. Soon, she was beating us all. My father was in awe of her and would do anything she said. And what did Credonia say? She told Kipateri that their movement would be built the same way Christ constructed his own. Property would be relinquished. Wealth would be sacrificed for the mission. Kibwitere began selling his excess properties off, a necessary exchange. He finally realized, working through his own warped internal logic, that true power didn't need a link through physical property because true power was spiritual. He also sold his mill's equipment and pulled his children out of school, the school he had built. Strict homeschooling under Credonia's watch would be the new order of business from here on out. The foundation was laid. Credonia would be the programmer, the one who instituted the rules and set the course of the movement. Kibiteri would be the figurehead, eventually bestowed with the title of bishop. But if they were to define themselves as a legitimate Catholic enterprise, they needed some Catholic firepower. They needed clergy. Later accounts from the movement's holy text state that Kibwitere was led north by the Virgin, telling him to seek out a religious devotee known as Scholastica Kamagara. In truth, Scholastica was just someone Kibwitere's wife Teresa already knew. She was a vocal figure in the diocese in central Barara district. Although not an administrator within the church herself, she had family connections, and there was one man in particular who seemed ripe for the movement's picking. Another man scorned by his own ambition. The man who would complete the movement's construction and send them hurtling toward their collectively imagined doomsday revelation. As we've come to learn, status was important in Uganda, especially within the religious realm. With an inept and corrupt government surrounding them, the Catholic institution provided some semblance of authority, and the priests in charge knew this. As Professor Atu Hare writes in his profile of the Ugandan cult tragedy, quote, Religious teaching as a product of missionary work has always portrayed priesthood in a mystified fashion, to the extent that the claimed infallibility of the Pope is generally believed to be shared by the clan of priests working for the Catholic mission. With the credibility of the institution behind them, priests enforced this hierarchy over the years, establishing themselves as arbiters of society, capable of dealing out punishments and blessings in equal measure. Respect was their currency. Which is why the soft-spoken friar Dominic Katari Ba'abo stood out so much. He wasn't one who wielded his respect with a heavy hand. Genial and articulate, Dominic seemed to fit much better into the gentle priest archetype a humble follower of God. Dominic was rector of the Kitabi Seminary in the Bushenyi district of western Uganda, directly west of the central Mbarara district from the late 1970s to the early 1980s. A part of the Rugazi parish under the greater Mbarara diocese, Dominic was well positioned in the hierarchy for strong upward mobility. A surrogate father for many of his students, Dominic was a refuge in a storm. He won his followers through compassion instead of strict discipline. The best example of this emerges through his relationship with pupil Joseph Kasapura Ari. Dominic saw something in the quiet young man that reminded the friar of himself. Every year within the seminary, there were elections for pupil leadership roles. Kasapura Ari sought such a role, but he didn't have the personality to carry the vote. Despite this, as Dominic announced the various winners, he took a dramatic beat before finishing and, in a surprised voice, told the seminary that Kasapura Ari had indeed won a role in the student government. Hmm, rigging the election was nice, but was it deliberate kindness or a tool to earn loyal devotion? It's difficult to ascertain. Religion was so entwined in these men's lives that the difference between an act of generosity and, and an ambition play are hard to distinguish. That's the trouble of investing religious institutions with such societal power. Well, whatever the case was, Dominic's actions earned Kasapur Ari's eternal gratitude. With such followers at his back, Dominic knew he would appear as a true holy man amongst the Rugazi parish. This pleased him, because underneath the gentle exterior, Dominic shared a similar condition with Joseph Kibwitere and Credonia, a lust for something more in his life. One account, recorded in Professor Atu Hare's history, tells of Dominic once forcing the seminary workers to spend countless hours digging through the swamp behind Kitabi, 
all because he found one stone that shone with glittering elements. Even a small find like that was enough to whet Dominic's greedy appetite. In his mind, it didn't clash with his religious belief. If one was not willing to do whatever it took to better one's position, they were wasting the life and willpower God had given them. Common phrases from his weekly self-help guru sessions with his students ran the gamut from statements like, you are not cheap, to always aim high, to if you want peace, prepare for war. Not the most common dialect for a priest, after all. Value, it seemed for Dominic, was not found in faith in God, but faith in oneself, an idealized, libertarian self-sufficiency. Like we've seen with Kibuteri and Credonia, unrealized ambition can be dangerous fuel. Dominic secretly had it in spades. Within the Mbarara diocese as a whole, those of the Rugazi parish held a feeling of superiority about themselves, they saw themselves as the true leaders of the area's religious destiny. Many of the Rugazi parish had historically received influential positions within the Diocese of Uganda. Positions like treasurer, editor of the church's newspaper, or the coveted title of vicar general. Friar Dominic always fancied himself a shoe-in for the role of bishop in the nearby Kasese diocese. This illusion was soon shattered when another friar was gifted that honor. Instead, Dominic was to remain in his small seminary. Many in the church believed Dominic had tried to garner too much local support for himself. Those of the diocese saw a potential usurper beneath his quiet demeanor. They probably weren't mistaken in this thinking, but they were mistaken in thinking that Dominic had nowhere else to turn. At his lowest point, a friend came to save Friar Dominic Kitaribabo, his old student Joseph. Joseph Kasapura-Ari was the son of none other than Scholastica Kamagara, the woman Kibwetere had been pointed to either by the Virgin Mary or his wife, Teresa. Born to Scholastica and her husband, John Kamagara, Joseph was always molded to be their religious warrior. Scholastica and John were fiercely devoted people. They had wanted to become a nun and priest, respectively, but for some reason were never able to achieve such status. Perhaps they just never had enough money to impress the right people in the diocese. In their son, they saw a chance to redeem that failure. They made sure he attended Mass every day and pushed him in his own ambitions at the Kitabi Seminary. When Dominic's frustrations became known to Joseph, Scholastica relayed this information to Kibwateri. In turn, Credonia became aware that an ordained Catholic authority was wavering in his faith. Dominic, Joseph, and his parents were all highly desirable candidates for conversion in Credonia's eyes. They were highly educated, prominent in the Catholic world, and most importantly, a tight-knit group. This would soon emerge as Credonia's dominant theory of recruitment, aiming to enlist full families and neighborhoods en masse. This would be the most efficient way to build a workable infrastructure for what would soon become the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. In this burgeoning movement, Dominic's ambitions came in line with Credonia's and Kibuteri's. If the Catholic Church did not want to give him higher power, he would take some for himself, and he would prove them wrong. The movement never branded itself as anything separate from Catholicism, even at the start. They were less a rebel group, just a group of devotees concerned that the Church had gone off track. They were the chosen few who could save it. Dominic was made into the Vicar General. He lived the words he spoke to his students. He saw what he wanted in life, and he made it happen for himself. If the church wouldn't give him such an honor, Dominic would still find the way to achieve what he knew was rightfully his. Joseph Kasapura-Ari and his parents entered the movement as apostles, and the enterprise gained momentum. Before conversions could begin in earnest, a text was needed. While the Bible was still canonized by the movement, their narrative depended on the idea that the Virgin Mary returned to earth with a new directive from on high. Credonia needed to finalize a version of a timely message from heaven. A religious text is the foundation of any movement. It is the rules, it is the law, it is the culture. It needs to communicate the grand mission in the clearest possible way. And clarify, Credonia did. A quote from the text itself. There will be great tribulation upon all the people, such that has never been experienced by any person since the creation of the world. 
people will be absent-minded and will develop a spirit of independence from God in their deeds, and this spirit will displease the Creator. He will, in reaction, release to the world chastisements that will include the shedding of blood. In other words, the apocalypse was coming. God was enraged at humanity, and it took a last-ditch effort from the Virgin Mary and Christ Himself to halt the Creator's wrath. Credonia and her followers were the final line of defense and the final chance of salvation. The Virgin and her son had tasked the movement with redeeming as many as possible before the end times. And the end times seemed right around the corner. As Idi Amin fell from power, civil war tore Uganda apart. He killed from 200,000 to 500,000. Uh, he was brutal in terms of torture. He left them no structure. He left them nothing but horrors. There was a mass vulnerability in the citizens of the country, a desperate hope. Time was ticking down. On top of the war consuming their country, the new millennium was a decade away. The irrational fear and paranoia surrounding the date across the world was amplified in Uganda. And the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God would provide what the Catholic Church could not, an ark, a vessel to heaven. Unfortunately for the passengers, it was actually taking them closer to a grisly end. Next week, we'll enter into the movement ourselves, diving into the recruitment process, the training of these recruits, and the hierarchy of terror that Credonia issued into existence in the name of her God. We will dissect the psychologies of those who followed the movement, those who fled from it, and those who ultimately lost their lives because of it. By the turn of the millennium, over 980 members would be dead. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next Tuesday as we continue to investigate the tragic creation and destruction of the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, production assistance by Maggie Admire, Joel Stein, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by Jack Bentel and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Wondering what to listen to next? Check out my other podcast, Historical Figures. Every Wednesday, my co-host Carter and I dig up what you don't know about the icons you do know. We cover their unique personality, entertaining anecdotes, and little-known facts, showing you the real humanity behind mythologized figures. And it's also a ParCast podcast, so you can find Historical Figures anywhere you listen to cults. Historical Figures officially launches October 11th, but we're offering loyal listeners a sneak peek. Head on over to the Historical Figures feed now by searching Historical Figures to listen to our episode on Albert Einstein.